Welcome to our video on training tips. Today we'll be going over various TensorFlow utilities and practices related to training your models. Throughout the course, we've been using TensorFlow's optimized loss function to handle the gradient updates and backpropagation computations. Today we'll peek under the hood to see the next layer of abstraction for how this is done and how it can help us customize our training procedures should we ever want to. At the same time, we'll explore certain characteristics of the Atom Optimizer that help us understand why it's so popular. Then, we'll go over an improved implementation of the early stopping hook we started in the last video, and we'll show how to use it for checking validation accuracies. Throughout the video, we'll also be illustrating various ways to monitor how your model's doing while it's training, which will also spill over into the next video on debugging strategies. So, today we're going to dive straight into code. We're going to begin with the optimized loss implementation that I just spoke about, the simplified version. So far, we've used the optimized loss function as a black box that we entrust with handling the gradient computations and weight updates. Although this function can certainly handle many use cases, there will inevitably be a time when you want to customize your training procedure in a way that the optimized loss function doesn't support. For this reason, and also because it's just interesting to see how things work, we're going to look at how this is implemented. Specifically, I've implemented a simplified version of optimized loss that includes the main source code without all the various parameter checking and error handling that the original source code has. Occasionally, when I feel that I don't understand some TensorFlow implementation as well as I should, I'll read through the source code and re-implement the function myself so that I can clearly see the main operations taking place. So here we see the simplified version, where I've only kept the parameters that we've been using as arguments, and I'll use the defaults for the omitted ones. Uh, we'll start by getting the global step variable, tf.train.getGlobalStep, as is done in the original source code. And the only reason we're grabbing the global step variable is because we'll be incrementing it by one after applying the gradient updates. We wrap the input scalar loss tensor with a dependencies on update ops, which will ensure that any update operations already in the graph will have been run anytime we use the loss variable. The learning rate we pass in is converted to a TensorFlow variable, and then pass the constructor of the optimizer of our choice. Note that the optimizer class names here is a dictionary from the name of the optimizer we pass in to its associated constructor in the tf.train module. Here I'll scroll up just so we know what this is referring to. So this is the same as defined as in the original optimized loss source code shows the set of allowed optimizers we can pass in, and then how they're mapped to the constructor that it gets called. And know that these are all subclasses of tf.train.optimizer, so they all have the same public methods. Going back down. So now we've created our optimizer with the initial learning rate. Next, we'll simply call its compute gradients function on the loss that we've passed in, and we'll specify the list of variables that we want to compute the gradients with respect to, optionally. I've shown it here just for clarity. We are going to be optimizing the loss with respect to all trainable variables. This is the first part of a two-step process. First, we compute the gradients here, and then next, we'll apply the variable updates based on those gradients. Before applying those updates, we're going to handle the clip gradients, which we've been setting to five in the past videos. This will ensure that the global gradient norm of our variables never exceeds the value of clip gradient. This helps things like preventing exploding gradients. We can then make some tensor board summaries for each of our gradients to see how they change over the course of training, and we'll look at a few examples at the end of this video and maybe some general ways of uh, interpreting those when we're training our models. After creating the summaries, we do the uh, gradient updates application. Updating the variables according to their gradients, details of which will differ for each optimization uh, algorithm. The Atom Optimizer, which we've been using, so named to mean adaptive moments, is distinguished by its use of estimators for the first and second moments of the gradient. And I've chosen to make custom summaries for those variables here, the internal optimizer variables of Atom, and we'll be seeing the associated plots shortly. I encourage you to read through the implementations in this file in more detail, and also try going one step deeper. Try reading the source code for things like compute gradients and apply gradients to see what's going on even further under the hood. As usual, we return the train op, and notice how the train op is defined. Uh, many people may not know that, uh, for example, all the train op is for turning our loss variable with the constraint that we must run the gradient updates first. So it's just a dependency check, but it will evaluate to the loss. This is just a clever way of making sure that all of our gradient up updates get applied and our weights get changed. Now I'll briefly go back to the model function where we use this so that we can see where this is situated. It's the same place as before. So this is within the same model function we've been using from section 3. Um, instead of calling the tf.contrib.layers.optimizeLoss, I've called this custom version here in the exact same manner. So now let's go and move on down to the creation of our early stopping hook, which we also started with a basic implementation in a previous video. So now we're going to be using this inside the eval mode because we're going to have our stopping condition be the validation accuracy. So just under the mode for eval, 
I create our early stopping hook, I set it to the accuracy, which will be the validation accuracy anytime this block is entered. What's new here that we didn't see before is this value of patience, which further asserts that we should trigger early stopping if the validation metric doesn't improve for patience number of evaluations. Let's see how this is implemented. Going to our hooks.py file. Here's our early stopping hook. I'm going to scroll down to the initial constructor. Most of this code should look very familiar from the previous video, but notice what happens with these new arguments, patience and the optional epsilon values. They're simply passed on to this new helper that I've created called max window. The epsilon variable is a tiny number that defines what we mean when we say unchanged over the past patience number of evaluations. Specifically, we require that our metric increases by at least epsilon more than its lowest value over the past patience number of evaluations. This is done with our helper class max window, which I will scroll up to the implementation of that. It's real short right here. We see that it has just one method, update, and a simple getter method has increased, which we can call to see whether it's time to terminate early. Every time we call update with a new value, our max window helper will append it to its internal queue of max length patience. And if it ever receives a value that's smaller than the smallest in its queue, it sets its has increased attribute to false, indicating that it's time to stop. But let's see how this is actually used inside of our early stopping hook. So I'm scrolling past the uh, constructor that we just saw, and I'm going to after run the implementation in early stopping hook. So here's the code we had from our last video, which just simply checks, has my metric value increased more than the max metric? If so, let's stop. But the new addition now is, we also have a call to maxwindow.update, followed by asking if our metric has increased. If it hasn't, we call self.stop with a message indicating the metric hasn't increased enough to continue. This is just one example of how you can fine tune your training procedure and utilize early stopping in order to prevent overfitting. If you want to hear more details regarding the use of early stopping as a model regularizer, please read through the additional resources slide at the end of the video. Now, let's head over to TensorBoard and observe how monitoring the things that we've seen like gradient norms and optimizer variables can give us a better understanding of how the model is learning and performing. Some background on what we're about to see. I trained the basic bidirectional LSTM model that we made in section 3 on 1 million Amazon reviews. Each example in the training data was a text review and the associated rating given by the author of the review for the product they were reviewing. Each review rating was an integer from 1 to 5 and the model is trained to predict the rating given the text. But enough about the data, we're here to talk about general practices for monitoring training. Let's check out the plots we made in the Customize Optimize Loss function. That's in this Optimize Loss tab on the scalars. And here we see a bunch of gradient and optimizer plots. Let's look at these individually. Let's start with the Atom Optimizer. So the Atom Optimizer has what does what's called adaptive learning rates, which means that it's going to actually have, in some sense, a different learning rate for each parameter in the model. So I wanted to see how this learning rate was changing with time because it is updated automatically within the Atom Optimizer. So this is a plot of what I've called the effective learning rate. I encourage you to read more on the resources slide for what these, the effective learning rate is, but essentially it is the average over all the different learning rates for all the parameters, just to see in general where we are at. So we see that it starts off very high, and depending on each of these different configurations, by the way, the difference between these configurations is the initial learning rate. So I wanted to see how much Atom is sensitive to the initial learning rate and how it changes based on where it starts. So if I scroll to the very end of this plot here, we look at the values that are popping up in front of us. I assume that most of these be converging to a very similar number because we hope that the Atom optimizer is not too sensitive to the initial parameters. But we do see that, for example, the learning rate 1e negative 4 ended up being around 2.2 times 10 to the negative 4. So it didn't change too much by the very end. Same with things like 5e negative 4, for example, ended up around 3e negative 4. Something that I found kind of interesting, however, is that the best performing learning rate for me in these uh, situations has been 1e negative 3. That's what we've been defaulting to as well. And 1e uh, negative 3, actually, the learning rate did not decrease uh, below it or even relatively near it like these other ones. It uh, stopped at 1e uh, negative 2, actually. So it was a little bit larger, the effective learning rate was, at least. So this is just to get a general feel for uh, how to approach the training process. You do a set over the scan hyperparameters of interest, so I did one over a learning rate, and we look at each of the individual plots and seeing whether the results that we got actually matched our expectations and what we can learn from them. The remaining two uh, plots for the Atom Optimizer in particular are these, I said that the Atom Optimizer looks at two different estimates for moments, so the first and second moments. In TensorFlow, they call the first moment M and the second moment V. The general idea, though, is that as the v norm here increases in scale, 
the effective learning rate is going to decrease because the effective learning rate turns out is actually inversely proportional to the square root of v norm. So as this increases, our effective learning rate is being driven down. So it's really interesting to analyze these plots and see how the learning rate was tuned across and also the fact that this gives us information about the gradients as well. V norm is the second moment for the gradient, so it's going to be proportional to the gradient squared element-wise over all the parameters. But enough about the atom-specific ones, let's look at some more general plots. So these are the different gradient norms over the main portions of our computation graph. And if there's one thing I can notice that's common about a few of these plots that really stands out to me is that this pink one really seems like the outlier across all of these. And so what is the pink one here? That's the learning rate associated with 1e negative 2, which is the highest learning rate that we started with. And it also turns out to be the worst performing in terms of accuracy and loss as well. And it's actually, it's interesting not to just have your plots for accuracy and loss, but also to have the fact that you can see exactly why it was performing so badly. And that's because either we had extremely large gradients or they just completely tapered off to zero very quickly in the training. In general, if your gradients are going to zero, that means it's likely getting close to a local minimum inside the loss space. If they're increasing and exploding off, that's definitely an indicator that you need to check something with your optimizer because again, we're supposed to be driving our gradients lower and lower because we are trying to find a minimum. And so if your model is only getting higher and larger gradients, there's definitely something going on that's undesirable. One last note is that I found that over the course of trying out TensorFlow that the gradient norms are really the most informative uh, way to, to get a general sense of the gradient information of your model as it's training because you can get the individual gradients for each of the parameters and do plots like that, but then you're looking at, you know, 50, 100 plots. So the, the gradient norms of the main layers, is, as we're seeing here, gives you a more uh, quick summarized sense and enough to really throw out certain spaces of uh, hyperparameters. As always, make sure to read through the links here for an in-depth look at the topics covered today. Coming up next, debugging strategies, where we're going to learn some useful tools and concepts for debugging TensorFlow models in particular.